Welcome to this session um, in the Pastres series. We're going to focus today on the links between poverty, livelihoods and social protection generally and specifically in relation to pastoral areas. Now this is a huge, huge set of topics and this talk is going to be far from comprehensive but I want to use it really just to raise some questions and particularly the question of whether standard approaches to understanding poverty and livelihoods and social protection measures apply in pastoral areas or whether we have to think in different ways. Now of course debates about welfare and support and uh, forms of social protection go back a long way particularly in the European settings to struggles over workers rights, over women's rights, around mutual societies and friendly societies supporting people in uh, who, who were deprived in, in, in harsh times around the role of the church and then uh, particularly after the Second World War the emergence of a, a welfare state certainly in the UK and the Na National Health Service emerged in 1948 um, as a result of these long-term struggles for uh, ensuring that livelihoods are uh, made secure. So the idea of welfare and the idea of a provision, a, a, a sort of a, 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 an umbrella in the picture on the bottom right that is provided by the state or other uh, agencies to protect people has a long history. But it has a long history based in struggle around particular themes, which is important to remember. Now, in development studies, there is an absolutely massive set of literatures uh, around the relationships between poverty and livelihoods and inequality and well-being and so on. And I'm not going to go into, into this in, in huge detail. Uh, these sets of books raise various questions about um, questions about how poverty emerges, not just through questions of lack, but through questions of entitlement. The argument of Amartya Sen, for example. How poverty emerges due to wider political and economic relationships, for example, between the r rural and the urban. The debate in Urban Bias by Michael Lipton. How poverty emerges over long periods of time through complex interacting poverty dynamics which have to un be understood in more interdisciplinary ways. And then the debates that hi highlight the uh, a critique of standard uh, simple poverty line measures of, of, of poverty associated with income or consumption for example to think more broadly about questions of, of, of broader well-being for example or human development defining poverty in a rather broader way and then linking that um, more broadly to, to issues of uh, understanding inequality and wealth. So across these debates what we mean by poverty and what we mean by responding to poverty through development interventions varies massively definitions in this sense really do matter. Now in the context of pastoral areas where as we can see from that the map in the top left hand corner the areas where pastoralism is concentrated are often associated with some of the lowest per capita GDP rates in the whole world. Not exclusively so but uh, the relationship between poverty and pa pastoralism is significant. And there have been some really excellent studies on the nature and the emergence of, of poverty uh, within pastoral economies. I highlight one book there by John McPeak and others uh, on, um, on East Africa highlighting how poverty emerges not just through uh, again dipping below a particular line 
but in relation to a whole set of dynamic features in society associated with social dynamics and risk dynamics. Now how we understand poverty in a, in a particular setting really does require us to understand the setting within which uh, we're, we're making that inquiry. Because poverty, although we can talk about a dollar a day or two dollars a day as a, as a broad metric to, to understand who's poor and who's not, does that really mean anything in any particular setting? There was a great study by Bokutache some years ago um, as part of his thesis and then subsequently published in, in, a, in a journal article in world development which looked at poverty indicators, sort of conventional poverty indicators from in this case the Ethiopian government and, um, and aid agencies and how pastoralists understood poverty themselves. And what they found, what he found in this study in Burana in southern Ethiopia in, the de in, a, in a pastoral area was that pastoralists had at least seven different types of understanding of what poverty meant according to a whole set of criteria that related not just to income and consumption but to access to resources, social resources but also livestock assets not surprisingly. And they made the argument I think in the, in the World Development Paper in particular that an asset based focus in pastoral areas for understanding poverty is important. But the broader point was that in order to understand poverty we have to understand the people that we're, we're working with and have to get the local understandings of that from them. And this has been a, a train of thinking within uh, broadly understood poverty studies within development over many years. Um, the World Bank's uh, Crying Out for Change Voices of the Poor project was actually uh, a, an attempt by a group within the bank to provide a counter to some of the more standard ways of thinking about poverty that were dominant in the development economics framing that, that, that guided much of World Bank thinking and practice. And what they did across a huge number of countries was actually listen to poor people and get them to articulate uh, what that meant, what poverty meant for them. And often, often it wasn't material deprivation, it was lack of rights, lack of dignity, lack of sense of, of identity and belonging, uh, the lack of, of, of association with, with um, political factors and so on and so forth. So emerging out of these sort of debates there has been a, a set of techniques and approaches for thinking about poverty in a slightly different way from a more bottom-up way and approaches such as wealth ranking or well-being ranking uh, as participatory approaches to get people themselves to understand uh, and to reflect on, on what, what poverty or well-being what being well-off or less well-off in a particular setting means uh, have imp been important contributors to the debate about uh, what we mean and understand by poverty. And that's particularly important in pastoral areas because as Bokutache's uh, study clearly showed that the standard approaches derived for example from the agrarian highlands or from urban areas or from Europe or North America or wherever just don't necessarily translate over uh, as, well as, they, as well as they might. So, how then should we think about what poverty means? Now, the Institute of Development Studies, f where the uh, Pastores project is, is based, has been debating these issues for decades. And the IDS Bulletin, the House Bulletin, um, has uh, reflected on this in, in many different ways over the years. And here are some covers of some of the some of the important bulletins that have, have raised questions about what we mean by poverty, including in pastoral areas. So the one at the top left hand corner, vulnerability, how the poor cope, was an early attempt by the likes of Robert Chambers and Jeremy Swift and others to expose how we understand underlying patterns of vulnerability and how poor people cope 
with shocks and stresses. And this again moved away substantially from a narrow poverty line focus to think about assets, to think about institutions, to think about moral economies as ways in which uh, diverse populations respond to uh, shocks um, and forms of vulnerability, often which are deeply embedded and structural. The Bulletin on Seasonality in Poverty, again involving Robert Chambers and many others, um, really focused in on how poverty is not just uniform over time, but actually varies uh, substantially. And this obviously is vitally important um, in pastoral areas because seasonalities um, within years, between years, uh, obviously affects who's poor and who's not, which livestock um, uh, die, who's, what the pattern of stocking and restocking can occur uh, in very different ways. So understanding coping mechanisms in relation to seasonalities and interannual variations is a crucial uh, debate. The Bulletin on Poverty Policy and Aid um, uh, went back to these debates about how we, how we measure po poverty and how we understand poverty more, more broadly. And there, an early argument, I believe this was, was produced in 1996, for a sort of multi-dimensional approach to poverty assessment was, was put forward. One that takes the quantitative analysis of income and consumption measures, but, uh, but articulates this with an understanding of asset ownership as well as uh, institutional and social factors that affect how people perceive and, uh, um, and respond to conditions of poverty. More broadly and more recently, um, uh, debates about how poverty is linked to processes, social processes of exclusion and inclusion in society, and how poverty is linked to processes of, of environmental and climate change in particular, and the role of adaptation as, as, a, a, as a route to coping uh, with climate change and poverty at the same time. So all these debates, of course, resonate in pastoral areas, but they land uh, in pastoral settings in quite different ways. And the, very, and the recent bibliography on the move that was produced in 2020 to celebrate the 50th anniversary of work on pastoralism within the Institute of Development Studies uh, has examples of uh, work in, in each of these or most of these uh, bulletins and much, much more besides. And we can understand from this that actually thinking about poverty, livelihoods, vulnerability, forms of coping in pastoral areas requires a particular set of understandings because the way people cope, the form that shocks take, the way that resilience or bouncing back happens is very particular in pastoral areas and, and in the non-equilibrium environments that pastoralists live, live in. And this is why poverty policy and development policy more broadly has to be attuned to pastoral settings uh, in particular ways. Now how is this thought about in a broader debate about social protection? Because one of the big themes of work that emerges out of all of this, a more sort of operationally orientated set of, uh, of questions is, if we understand poverty and livelihoods, what can we do in order to support uh, those who are poor, those who are, who are struggling, um, and those who are particularly vulnerable to shocks and stresses? Now, there have been very big debates about ideas of social protection, which build on those longer term discussions about welfare and mutual support that uh, I started with at the beginning, longer historical discussions of what that, what it means for states and citizens to interact in order to support the most marginal and the most vulnerable. This diagram here is a figure from a paper, uh, an IDS working paper by colleagues Stephen Devereaux and Rachel Sabatas Wheeler from 2004, updated several times since uh, under the aegis of the Centre for Social Protection based at IDS. Uh, 
And they make the important argument, made by others indeed, uh, since that social protection mustn't be just about safety nets, not just about basic welfare provision for the poorest, not just about a sort of paternalistic view of supporting the deserving poor through aid. It must be a much more active approach to thinking about how you can move from what they term protective social protection the classic social assistance programs of 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 safety nets and and uh, food aid and cash for work and and so on to more preventive approaches of social security including building insurance and diversification mechanisms to promotive and trans and ultimately transformative social protection and they made the argument that it was these latter approaches which they classified as springboards rather than safety nets that move that help move people from just being passive deserving poor if you like to to active citizens who can grasp the economic opportunities and be transformed through uh, through action and this requires the state to operate in a different way not just providing for those who are dropping off the end although that remains important in times of crisis but also thinking about how to uh, provide rights to pr provide minimum wage legislation for example labor market re regulations forms of support for uh, livelihoods of different sorts um, that allow transformative economic opportunities to emerge. Now this broad argument that social protection isn't just about safety nets has been widely accepted but in practice we see and this certainly happens in pastoral areas the standard operational programming of big NGOs, UN agencies and others, the default is very often the old style safety net approach. It's easier to deliver, it, it situates itself within a humanitarian and emergency frame rather than a development frame and linking um, emergency and relief to development has been a long running debate particularly in pastoral areas where crises often emerge and we often don't get this type of transformative approaches being uh, developed in pastoral areas and indeed other areas because the approaches are very much focused on filling a gap assessing a risk uh, delivering a risk management solution and um, preventing disaster through particular types of technocratic intervention and the problem with this, as we've seen in many of the other sessions in this course, is this doesn't get to grips with the nature of uncertainty and variability and mobility in pastoral livelihoods. These are forms of response that are very controlling, very, uh, very standardized, very technocratic, and the type of social protection measures we often see uh, as applied in pastoral areas often simply don't provide the type of support that we would hope. So what's the response to this? And this is very much embedded in, in ideas around a broader perspective on social protection, is the idea of the aim is to develop the capacities of people to have broader, more sustainable livelihoods. And this idea of sustainable livelihoods which was raised in a another IDS working paper way back in 1992 uh, by Robert Chambers and Gordon Conway. They made the argument, building on Amartya Sen's concept of capabilities, that a livelihood comprises the capabilities, assets, including both material and social resources, and activities for a means of living. A livelihood is sustainable, they said, when it can cope with and recover from stresses and shocks, maintain or enhance its capabilities and assets while not undermining the natural resource base. And that definition of sustainable livelihoods has become uh, 
very popular and become became increasingly popularized in the latter part of the 1990s and through the 2000s because this was a much more integrative approach to uh, poverty programming not focused just on delivery filling gaps but trying to enhance the um, sustainability of livelihoods themselves a much more bottom-up approach rooted in the type of p what p people actually do and starting with what people do and the relationships that people have the institutions that support how people uh, gain, a, gain a living and later in the 1990s and I was involved in this this process together with others at IDS there was a, a framework produced called uh, the sustainable livelihoods framework which became widely used in in aid programs and NGOs and so on which tried to link the broader context within which people live the nature of resources that people have uh, access to often um, called uh, livelihood assets or, or livelihood capitals and how these and asking questions about how these are transformed into different sex sets of activities often diversified livelihood activities that deliver differentiated outcomes both of livelihoods and of uh, of sustainability and that this process of transforming livelihood assets into activities into outcomes is mediated by institutions and policies so it was a very simple framework and uh, you can see the, the the in the background there the basic framework that was developed at IDS in uh, 97 98 and it provided a useful way of thinking about livelihoods in a more in a broader way than just again narrowly focusing down on poverty and I think the livelihoods framework was useful in a variety of different ways including informing social protection programs and and, and, and informing the thinking about how one had to move from safety nets towards more um, more transformative um, approaches and it became also important in thinking about pastoral areas to try and get into what it was in pastoral areas what were the nature of livelihood capitals if you like what type of, what forms of of assets did pastoralists have that made livelihoods and rather like what Bokutache and others uh, argued thinking about the nature of the outcomes not just in terms of standard indicators but in ones that were relevant and appropriate to uh, their particular settings of, of, of pastoralism, mobile pastoralism. So it had this advantage of going beyond the narrow focus of income and consumption poverty to think about these broader outcomes and link these into debates about, uh, about sustainability and environment. But one of the critiques of the original framework, which I thoroughly agree with, was that it was too descriptive and it was too apolitical or at least as it was applied it was too apolitical it didn't get to questions of of access and the politics of access and how um, both institutions and politics and social relations affected how what people were able to do and why although in the grey box in the middle under institutions and organizations that was supposed to be hidden away in there it often wasn't in the instrumentalized use of the framework. You can hear a bit more about the history of the use of this framework and the, the longer history of livelihoods approaches in a separate lecture which is associated with this series. But in 2015 in response to some of these critiques I was encouraged to write this short book called Sustainable Livelihoods in Rural Development which, which took this history of debates about livelihoods not specifically in pastoral areas but more broadly and try to link these with debates within agrarian political economy because in agrarian political economy there are a number of questions that are regularly asked and Henry Bernstein for example identified f four 
all of which seem to me to relate very directly to the livelihoods framework. So he asks who owns what, who gets access to what, what do they do with it, who does what, who gets what, these basic questions of relationships which are embedded in power uh, in uh, local settings. And more broadly, one asks, has to ask how in relation to these dynamics which create social classes and patterns of differential accumulation as we discussed in another uh, session in this course. How do social classes and groups in society interact with the state and indeed with each other? And the political ecology question, how do politics and ecology interact in shaping the context within which livelihoods happen? Now that may be all a little bit too abstract but my argument here is that these type of questions at their core as applied in pastoral settings or in indeed anywhere else can illuminate and take us way beyond where we often end up in narrow uh, poverty programming or social protection approaches as applied in pastoral areas which are only about safety nets not broader livelihood support. So how does all this land in um, pastoral areas? these debates about poverty, about vulnerability, social protection, resilience, livelihoods and so on. Across pastoral areas, and here's one example from Isiolo in northern Kenya, there are dozens and dozens of projects. This is a regional pastoral livelihoods resilience project. But beyond the words, there are the, the equivalents uh, nearly everywhere. And in pastoral areas, there are attempts to roll these out, particularly and often as a result of aid flowing in uh, as a result of um, a particular crisis or a major drought or disaster of some sort to support livelihoods in often highly, uh, very poor and vulnerable areas as part of government and aid programming. Now, the problem with a lot of these programs, and I, I would say that this isn't, isn't one of them, but uh, has, has, uh, th there are plenty of them out there, they often replicate what happens in more settled agrarian settings. So rural development as done in a peasant farming setting or a highland uh, agricultural area is just simply transported down into the lowlands and uh, is, is provided through these programs. And we end up with the, the, the standardised uh, set of projects. You know, there are there are you know projects around community gardening and off off farm women's women's income earning groups and water development and basic uh, basic service provision of various sorts. Now I'm not saying any of these are wrong or not useful, but they often don't tie in with an understanding of what. Uh, pastoralists need or how they live. So if people are mobile, if uh, vulnerabilities are highly seasonal, if shocks and stresses that affect particularly the poor are highly variable and uncertain, the standard disaster risk management um, approaches for asset building or targeting just simply won't work. And too often this overused notion of resilience is used very strat statically very often thought about instrumentally as bringing people back from an already poor and vulnerable uh, state to a similar status quo it's not transformative in other words questions of rights, of empowerment and so on, as highlighted in transformative social protection, are often not part and parcel of these resilience projects. And the default, as I've said before, in pastoral areas often is these standardised projects like veterinary care and water points and restocking and feedlots and so on, that in many ways don't look any different, just with a different label, to the productivist style projects that we've critiqued in other sessions in this course uh, 
uh, from the 60s and 70s. Just given an, a, a new label, a gloss of participation, a bit of women and youth involvement, and hey, here we are back to square one. So then what, we, what makes for a successful social protection and livelihood support intervention in pastoral areas? Getting to grips with mobility, getting to grips with the institutional basis on which pastoralism operates and the social relations that exist within and between domestic groups is absolutely critical. There have been a number of big studies of large-scale um, social protection programs, particularly in Ethiopia, and again IDS colleagues including Jeremy Lind, Rachel Sabatiswila and others have analysed the uh, application of the so-called PSNP, um, the, the safety net program in Ethiopia, in pastoral areas and found that the type of targeting, the type of technocratic approach developed quite successfully for the highlands of Ethiopia simply hasn't worked terribly well in the lowlands. Equally others, and there's a paper in the reading list from Adrian Cullis and Andy Catley, which slightly mischievously uh, analyzes two very different approaches to intervention in pastoral areas. One, a more commercial destocking uh, approach, which enables households to acquire cash through a certain amount of livestock sales at the moment of crisis and reinvest that in livelihood support. Very much a private sector led approach to destocking that allows people to gain income linked to the type of marketing that, that pastoralists do versus the classic aid intervention or government intervention of meeting um, household level food security uh, through food aid um, and then restocking only afterwards once livestock have died. They show that the former chiming with existing pastoral practices and marketing um, approaches is massively uh, more economic. So, so much for external interventions. What, what about how pastoralists cope without um, the role of the state, the role of social protection programs, the role of livelihoods and resilience programs and so on? What about the moral economies that underpin how pastoralists have always coped and survived with risks and uncertainties? Because for millennia, droughts, snow, uh, high snowfalls, pest attacks, disease have hit pastoral populations. And what the anthropological analyses of pastoral societies the world over shows is that deeply embedded in the social relations, the domestic uh, organization, the herding, sharing, redistributive practices that pastoralists follow is what Jim Scott would call a moral economy. His classic book, The Moral Economy of the Peasant, written in 1977, argued that this was very much part of the, the subsistence ethic of peasants that allowed people to survive in the face of, uh, of uh, shocks and stresses and allowed these re redistributive practices uh, help build forms of solidarity and forms of resistance to um, external, uh, external effects. Now, one shouldn't see the moral economy just simply as an alternative to say, state provision and protection. They can go together. But if we forget the fact that pastoralists have always had ways of, of coping embedded in uh, cultural social relations, sharing, learning, loaning, herd splitting, sudden sale and then re repurchase, tracking opportunistically the, 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 the uh, variabilities that exist in, in, their, in their environments, forms of migration and mobility that allow um, people to redistribute and, and cope. All of these very much embedded in standard pastoral practice and embedded in 
in in in the social relations amongst uh, amongst kin and domestic groups but also related to religious organizations that support whether the temple or the buddhist uh, monastery or the the mosque or the church or the informal uh, forms of insurance and 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 social mutual aid that exist within societies all of these add up to a an understanding of moral economy and moral economies of course aren't static they change so uh, classic old studies of, of of redistributive forms of economy in East Africa may have dramatically changed as livestock have become more co commercialized things have become more individualized but still there are ways that uh, forms of redistribution and support occur and they these days may be facilitated by mobile phones or WhatsApp groups or whatever that allow forms of collectivity and solidarity and sharing to happen in in new ways so let's not forget the nature of moral economy and let's not think that external interventions in the form of livelihoods programs, resilience programs or social protection programs or whatever can run independently of these because they must interrelate and often the failure as happened in, in, in Ethiopia when the translation of the PSNP uh, was, was, was rolled out in the lowlands unless you think about how these these operate in pastoral se settings the forms of targeting the forms of uh, of delivery are just simply not going to work if you try and translate a standardized technocratic approach to social protection or livelihood support to pastoral areas so again and again and again we have to ask the question how does both under how do both understandings of pastoralism and livelihoods and understandings of what poverty means and livelihood protection means in these settings um, how does this should this translate into into forms of external support and these are bigger questions so just to conclude we can ask bigger questions of how should social protection livelihoods resilience programs articulate with existing forms of social relation and moral economy so as not to disturb them and indeed how they mutually can support each other we need to not to reify the idea of moral economy that that actually local systems can always help people survive because actually they may not under under changing circumstances and anyway forms of local moral economy may be rooted in in highly uneven social structures um, exclusion of certain people, highly patriarchal relations and so on. We must think as I've said many times through this short talk about how social protection and poverty programs can articulate with with mobility, with variability, with inter and annual seasonal change in ways that don't just assume that everything is is static um, as as is sometimes um, sometimes thought, and we then have to think about well, what's the most appropriate approach? Uh, is can we think of ways of supporting pastoral populations in ways that don't disrupt forms of mobility that articulate with patterns of of marketing and sale? and that don't just flood these areas and create forms of dependency and displacement through food aid or cash for work or standardized programs that really don't chime with the livelihoods of pastoralists themselves. So thank you for listening. That is, concludes the talk.